As we draw closer to the final stages in the life of Arthur Morgan, Agent Milton confesses that Micah Bell was the real rat, assisting the downfall of the Vandalin gang. Now prior to this, Molly O'Shea, Duchess of the Half, confesses to being the one speaking to the Pinkerton Detective Agency, but was this confession really that false? Was it really Molly all along that turned on her lover and the rest of the gang? Well today, let's theorise. Welcome to the video, you're listening to Phil of Philby Gaming. If you enjoy what you see today, you all know what to do, and if you're new here and aren't subscribed to the channel already, please consider doing so. Please remember that today's video is theory based only, as the narrative tells a different tale, but hear me out on a few things, it may just change your perspective. With that being said, let's get in to what we came here to see. Was Molly O'Shea telling the truth all along? Before we get into the events of Red Dead Redemption 2, let's look at the character of Molly a little. She is described by Rockstar Games, creators of the title, as the following. A Dublin girl and the object of Dutch's affection, for now at least. Molly is too high strung for a life on the run and it's all starting to take a toll on her. She claims to be from a well-to-do Irish family who came over to America on a romantic whim in search of adventure and excitement. Molly certainly found that in Dutch Vandalin, but wants more than he can, or is prepared to, give her. She considers herself a few cuts above the other gang members, which hasn't won her many supporters in camp. This alone gives us a big insight to Molly O'Shea, as we see these claims of her character shine through as we progress through the story of Red Dead Redemption 2. Molly doesn't seem to consider herself a gang member or outlaw, She's simply in love with Dutch Vanderland, sticking by his side despite her views on his or the gang's actions. As early as Coulter, after the gang flee Blackwater, Molly refuses to take refuge with the members, refusing to not only bond with them through this difficult time, but barely acknowledging their existence. Her lack of responsibility and respect in and around camp is often noticed by others. Other people, finally. Look at all that snow on the mountains. Sure don't want to be back up there. You think we should have asked Molly to come with us? Oh no, Miss O'Shea is far too high and mighty now for the likes of us, or to do any real work. She's a society lady now. Molly is fully aware of some of the gang's feelings towards her, especially the girls, who not only help out around camp with chores, but also head out with the boys, putting themselves in dangerous positions. Believing she is above others, in particular Karen, Tilly and Mary Beth, when she learns that they've been mocking her, she can often have bursts of anger aimed towards them. I heard what you said about me. What? I said I heard what you said about me. Did you? Okay. I don't take it very fair. Okay, good for you. No, you're not so high and mighty and above everyone oh, than you think you are. Whatever you say. He bloody well loves me, do you know? He bloody well does. Of course. Of course he does. What exactly are we talking about? Damn you. Damn all you. You ain't so smart. You little trollop. Trollops. Often, she can be seen having heated arguments with Dutch. This may be due to Molly's frustration at coming from a wealthy family at her home in Ireland to seek an adventure in the United States not quite being what she anticipated. She does form good relationships with some of the other gang members. In particular, she's pretty close to Arthur Morgan. He's one of the very few she'll give her time of day to. This is more than likely because of the strong bond between Dutch and Arthur. It's a similar situation to Dutch's relationship with Susan Grimshaw. Molly avoids heated confrontation with the likes of those whom are closest to Dutch's heart. Is this all in fear of Dutch taking their sides over Molly's if a situation were to call for it? Potentially. At the tent of Dutch, the player can find a poem written by Molly O'Shea that isn't overly cryptic as to her feelings about her current situation and those around her. The title of this poem, which has different pronunciations according to a simple Google search, translates to proud, exuberant or arrogant, and the content that follows goes as such. I was a girl until your call commanded me to cross the sea. I've nothing left, I gave you all. My darling Liffy was so small, your land and love are vast and free. I was a girl until your call. You stood so strong and dark and tall, you stole the heartbeat out of me. I've nothing left, I gave you all. 
Your lips enchant, your eyes enthrall, your empire is of ecstasy. I was a girl until your call. Your parasites are lackeys crawl, mocking a love they dare not see. I've nothing left, I gave you all. I sit in solitude and scroll, these wretched words and wait for thee. I was a girl until your call. I've nothing left, I gave you all. There's quite a bit of information to take away from Molly's poem. For starters, we now know specifically where in Dublin Miss O'Shea was born and raised, by the river Liffey. But more importantly, let's look at the feelings she expresses in certain parts of the writing. I was a girl until your call commanded me to cross the sea. This is referencing Molly leaving her home to sail to the United States, then finding Dutch. You stood so strong and dark and tall, you stole a heartbeat out of me of course referring to Dutch Vanderlind himself. Your parasites and lackeys crawl, mocking a love they dare not see. Molly's feelings about the other gang members. I sit in solitude and scroll, these wretched words and wait for thee. I was a girl until your call. This is Molly expressing the loneliness and isolation she feels at times. And finally, she repeatedly states, I have nothing left, I gave you all. This is Molly claiming that she has given up everything to be with Dutch. It's her clear feelings in this poem that prompt so many arguments between both herself and Dutch and herself and the other gang members. She wants a specific way of life and isn't receiving it in her current situation. So why not leave the gang and head back home? Simple, her love for Dutch Vanderland is too strong. Towards the end of chapter 2, Arthur Morgan, when out fishing with Jack, is confronted by the Pinkerton Agency detectives, Milton and Ross, who in turn offered Arthur his freedom in exchange for turning on Dutch. But was he the only one to be approached? Did the Pinkerton somehow make contact with Molly around the same time? There is evidence supporting this theory. In the opening segment of the mission, An Honest Mistake, Molly beckons Arthur to ask the following. Call me Molly, would you? <sighs> Arthur, how is Dutch? I mean, how does he seem to you? I'm about the same as usual, I guess. I... I really love him, you know. But if he... Like he always says, loyalty is everything, so... Arthur! Excuse me, Miss O'Shea. What you want? I bring a gift. Molly's mention of loyalty pushes towards this theory that the Pinkertons have made contact with her, so she's both confiding and seeking advice from a man who knows Dutch very well, his best friend. Angered at the interruption by Uncle, Molly flays her arms and storms away. This is something she does quite often, showing her disgust towards some of the gang members and their ways. We see it again in the opening segment to Blessed are the Peacemakers, where as soon as she hears that the gang are going into violent conflict, she removes herself from the situation. She wants no part of a life like that. It's not what she signs up for. As the game concludes Chapter 3 and the gang's time at Clement's Point, there's even more telltale signs of Molly previously being approached by the Pinkerton agents. When Milton and Ross bring their head straight into the Van der Linds camp, every gang member locks eyes with them. But if you keep a close eye on Molly O'Shea, she spends more time looking at the other gang members, avoiding eye contact with the Pinkertons. You come with me, and I give the rest of you three days to run off, disappear, and go and live like human beings someplace else. Is she fearful of having her cover blown? As time goes on, the gang begins to fall apart. We've seen a few instances now where the Pinkertons are seemingly one step ahead of Dutch and his boys, prompting allegations that there is indeed a rat amongst them. Very shortly following this, as the gang arrive at their new home of Shady Bell, Bonnie approaches Dutch, looking visibly upset, wanting to tell him something. This looks to be the point where she wants to confess about the Pinkertons approaching her, but Dutch quickly brushes her off. Arthur, take a ride with me. Sure. Come on. Dutch? Yes? Could I have a word with you? <clears throat> Not now. Come on, Arthur. Can you believe that, girl? All I've got going on, and she wants to talk. Everything okay with you two? I got far more important things to worry about right now than Molly O'Shea. It's not long before Molly goes AWOL from the Vandalin gang for a while, before finally being brought back to camp by Uncle, 
where she was found to be heavily intoxicated in the city of Saint-Denis. These are her final moments. Mike and I'll sniff about, see if he knows we're here, and exactly what his plans are. So, Dort, did you miss me? I found her drunk in Saint-Denis. You're back. How jolly, Miss it's O'Shea. It's funny, you suck of shit. Back Who and drunk. The master, the Lord Molly, God Almighty. calm down. I won't be ignored, Dort Vanderlyn. I am in him. I ain't her. Or any of his stooges. Calm yourself, you don't owe me nothing. Miss. I don't owe you nothing. Nothing. Okay. I'll spit in your eye. I did. I told them. I'm sorry? Yeah, I told them and I tell them again. Now I've got God's ear. You told who what? Mr. Milton and Mr. Ross about the bank robbery. And I wanted them to kill you. You did what? I loved you, you goddamn bastard! Go on, shoot She's me! Crazy. She ain't worth it. You told on oh, me! You're you not betrayed so big now, me! Are you? Just calm down. Arthur? <laughs> She's a fool. Get her out of here. You know the rules. You are not so big now. Hurry, Your Majesty! You. Damn! <laughs> She knew the rules, Arthur. What the hell is wrong with you? Mr. Pearson, Mr. Williamson, get this body out of here and get it burnt. Okay. Now get back to work, all of you. Quit your lollygagging. Right. Get back to work. Many speculate that this was a false confession to Anger Dutch after what she felt was mistreatment by him. It was all for attention. She once again belittles the gang members during this, continuing to show her true feelings towards the majority of them, as written in the earlier poem. Fast forward to the final chapter of the main story of Red Dead Redemption 2. After the kidnapping of Abigail Roberts, Milton, when he has Arthur at gunpoint, states the following. We offered you a deal, Mr. Morgan. You should have taken it. I'm a fool, Mr. Milton. Not all you boys have... Quite so many scruples. Old Micah Bell. Micah? You mean Molly? Molly O'Shea? Sweated her a couple of times, never talked a word, had to let her go. Micah Bell. We picked him up when you boys came back from the Caribbean. And he's been a good boy ever since. Now was Agent Milton telling the truth. He admitted that the Pinkertons had questioned Molly a couple of times, all to no avail, and proceeded to place the blame on Micah, but here's a factor that some may not have considered. Is Agent Milton actually aware of the death of Molly O'Shea? Since her death, the kidnapping of Abigail is the first interaction between the Pinkertons and the Vandalins gang, so there's a very strong possibility that Molly is still believed to be alive by them. Him placing the blame on Micah may have been to throw a spanner in the works when it came to the gang. After all, his sole intention was to put an end to the outlaw way of life and help form civilization. We've experienced the sneaky and manipulative ways before when he attempted to sway Arthur, and when that didn't work, he targeted someone much more vulnerable. But back to the death of Molly O'Shea. If Molly felt that strongly about her anger towards primarily Dutch Vanderland, but also the majority of the gang, why not just flee back to her home of Dublin Island? In my honest opinion, she was trapped by her overwhelming feeling of love towards Dutch. This is why she's rarely seen away from his side throughout the entire game, and why she's so conflicted when approached by the Pinkerton Detective Agency. She wanted to speak privately with Dutch, but barely had the chance, as he was always brushing her off. So eventually, she turned to the ones who were listening, Agents Andrew Milton and Edgar Ross. So why the confession if the gang didn't suspect her at all? I think Molly felt the only way out of this life she was leading, a life that was far from the one she dreamed of when she sailed the waters to the United States, was to die. She saw no alternative, but if she was going out, she was going out with a clean conscience and one final blow to touch to bring him down after the mental torture she felt she'd been through. It was self-killing at the hands of another. Trapped by love, Molly knew that death was her only way out. If you guys enjoyed today's content, you all know what to do, and if you're new here and aren't subscribed to the channel already, please consider doing so. This video was strictly theory, but be sure to let me know in the comment section your thoughts on this, and whether you agree or disagree. 
Are there any characters or situations from the world of Red Dead Redemption 2 that you'd like to see me take a stab at analysing? Let me know. Thank you all for watching, you've been listening to Phil of Philby Gaming, and I'll see you in the next video.